It's nice to see so many friends here this morning for uh, our third lecture of the Center for Children and Families 16th year of spring lecture series. Time flies, it's great. Um, I'm Margaret Owen and I don't know everybody, so I'm Margaret Owen. I am currently the Dean of the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences. I am formerly the director of the Center for Children and Families, and um, I wanna welcome you all, um, many friends, and that's wonderful. Um, it is my pleasure to honor, well, and it's my pleasure to introduce, I'm very happy about, about us now. Um, I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Camillo Rujaro, and he is here with us very recently. He is currently a professor of psychology in the, uh, in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences, joining the faculty only this past January. He comes to us after serving for many years at the University of North Texas, and you're gonna hear more about the center that he directed there, I know. Just a little bit of background. Um, grew up in Corpus Christi and Austin, so not so very far away, and did his undergraduate work at the University, University of Texas at Austin. He completed his degree in clinical psychology, his doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Miami in Coral Gables. Um, following that, he completed a clinical internship and a postdoc in psychiatry at Brown University's Medical School. So his research has focused on the assessment of mood disorders, and he's played a major role in a new empirically based approach to classifying and describing mental illness. And he'll tell you what the acronym means. Um, but it's high top, and that's easy for us to remember, okay? Um, his center, his director, his center at North Texas was focused on combating behavioral health disparities in the North Texas region, and I'm eager to hear more about that. Um, as well, we don't have the title of his talk up, but you've all read it, and that's why you're here today. He is an internationally recognized expert in the area of the assessment of psychopathology. And so we are so very, very pleased to have him among us in our faculty now and bringing his skills and his expertise. He is widely, widely published, over 120 publications, and oh, the 20s come up again, over $20 million in grant support for his research over the years. Very, very impressive. So please join me in welcoming Thank you very much. This is really great, right before spring break. You guys are brave souls. I, I love it. Um, and thanks so much for inviting me to be a part of the, the Owen Eras Tour stop. I am thrilled to be on this tour. Uh, I am a Swifty fan because I listen to Taylor Swift every single day. I'm not kidding. In the morning, in the afternoon, at night. This is no joke. I Taylor Swift is constantly playing. I actually don't like Taylor Swift, but I have a 12 year old daughter. And so it doesn't matter what I like or don't like. I listen to Taylor Swift every single day. So um, so, so this is a real honor. She was jealous that I'm, I'm part of an era's tour. I uh, <laughs> wish she could be here. But, um, but in, in preparing for this, I, you know, I was thinking about Dr. Owen and her work. And there are four things I just want to highlight before I, I get into my talk about Dr. Owen and her work. And they happen to be things, four things that Taylor Swift does too. And they're the four things that I really respect because I think they're, they're pillars of like what a good scientist does. And the first um, is, is that she, that Dr. Owen has worked with really diverse communities and samples in her research. And I think that um, that's so critical. In psychology has a well-known problem of, of the weird, uh, you know, the Western certain specific kind of sample that we do base our science on. And that leads to all sorts of problems. And good scientists combat that. And Dr. Owen has done that in her work over and over again. And Taylor Swift does it too. She doesn't just do tours in California. She goes all over the world. The second thing that I think good scientists do is that they, um, they work with big samples. Uh, Jacob Cohen of Cohen's D, you know, one of my heroes, um, he used to tell his students, when you're doing science, it's really important to, you know, less is more except when it comes to sample size. And I think about work like the NIH study that you did, over a thousand families, 
that kind of, especially in an age where we're having replication crises over and over again, working with big samples protects science against that. And so, so that's, that's another kind of hallmark. And then the last two are the um, uh, doing things that matter. I think that's really critical. She has focused her research on areas that are developmental. I'm a clinical psychologist that mainly works with adults. By the time I see them, a person, you know, it's bait <laughs> what has happened. The trajectories of emotion regulation, those kinds of things really happen in those early stages. So it's so critical. I kind of wish I could go back and just focus on developmental because it's, it really sets the stage for everything else. Um, Taylor Swift only sings about things that matter too, according to my daughter, you know, really, <laughs> really critical things. And then the last one is, um, is engaging with communities. This event, this public event is a great example of that, of having a dialogue you know, with different communities about the kind of research you're doing. And um, Taylor Swift also engages with her fans. So anyway, if you want to do good science, look to Dr. Owen, look to Taylor Swift. I think those are, those are really critical guideposts for how to be a good scientist. All right, today I'm going to talk about um, work that I did at the University of North Texas with uh, Dr. Jennifer Callahan. We were asked, uh, gosh, this might have been in 2018, 2019, to, to take over a center that had been kind of defunct, uh, that had, was focused on behavioral health disparities in North Texas. And so as we approached that task, we asked this question of, okay, we're going to be focusing on North Texas region and behavioral health. What kind of community is this? And it's really important to ask yourself when you're doing research with different communities, what kind of city do I live in? Is it one region, one city? Is it multiple regions? What, what are these different communities? And so we kind of stepped back and we tried to guide the work that we did based on sort of certain evidence. And, you know, if my version of DFW is probably very different than your version of DFW. There are over 200 communities in this region. There's 8 million people. This is a population density map of DFW. And uh, I think one dot represents 24 people. And you can tell, you know, there are some rural areas out in Decatur and stuff and, and some much more dense areas. And growing up in one versus the other is going to have different uh, implications for what kind of experience you have growing up. There are racial and ethnic enclaves in DFW that are important to understand. The, again, this is uh, based on census data, but you see that there are some pretty strong enclaves of, of different race ethnicities. This does not have, because this is census data, this doesn't have international communities, but we all know there's some really strong, vibrant international communities in DFW. Again, growing up in one of these or another will have really different implications on how you experience DFW. There are also profound economic differences in DFW. There's also profound differences in health. And I, if I had to pick one marker of health, it's probably the most dramatic and the one that we all understand is that's your life expectancy. How, how long do you expect to live? And you can see this is a study that came out of UT Southwestern a few years ago. The data is a little dated. It's from like around 2010, 2015, but I, I don't think it's dramatically changed since then. But you can see this is every zip code and people's expected life expectancy. And there are tremendous, really profound differences depending on what zip code you grow up in, in terms of how long you're expected to live. If you zoom in on this, um, you can see this is a, these are two zip codes, for example, and the difference in life expectancy, this is just men in this, in this graph, but is, you know, in one zip code, average life expectancy is 63 years old. In another, it's 90. That's a 30 year gap. That's astonishing. That's profound. That's something that, you know, as Texans, we should care about how our fellow Texans are living and and this is a, a, a tremendous uh, disparity in terms of you know the final outcome of health uh, basically how long you're living most of it you know those are lives with children grandchildren uh, th this is a real uh, issue that we should focus on it's tempting to say oh this is a problem of cities it's not a problem of cities if you zoom out you can see profound differences in rural areas of texas where uh, of north texas where there are gaps uh, real differences between whether you're living in rural texas or urban texas what kind of life expectancy you're going to have so this is the kind of stuff that uh, people are thinking about and talking about when they talk about health disparities and they talk about health equities this gets um this is really kind of enshrined in, in a federal initiative that most of you are probably familiar with called Healthy People 2030. But basically what this is, this is a national effort to track health outcomes. I think there are three, two or 300 different health outcomes in communities across America. This began, this kind of initiative, this is like the fifth or sixth iteration of this. 
And uh, this began in the 1970s with the Surgeon General, where uh, the, the, the idea behind healthy people was we, we can't just simply treat people when they're ill. We have to you know, get in front of that and try to prevent illness. So they started tracking all these health metrics. Over the years, behavioral health, mental health got baked into this as sort of a, a really important metric to think about. And in recent iterations, this idea of health equity and health disparities became central to, um, to, to Healthy People 2030. And so one of its major overarching goals is to eliminate health disparities. The kind of disparities I, I just talked about uh, with respect to life expectancies is one example. By the way, there are many other kinds of examples of, of health disparities. <clears throat> this is, um, you know, when, when people talk about health dis disparities, they're talking about a particular type of health difference that's linked with social, economic, environmental disadvantage. This, this center, the CCF, does really important work at thinking about social determinants of health um, at early ages in terms of, uh, you know, just talking with different faculty about different research projects going on, looking at what kind of environmental influences are influencing children as they're growing up and families as, as they're navigating the world that lead to all sorts of health outcomes and have um, repercussions. And so typically people talk about different social determinants of health. These health disparities are complex. It's, there's not a simple solution to why they exist. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, so, so lots of different factors go into this. Our focus, Jennifer Callahan and I's focus when we took the center was to really focus on this issue of mental health disparities, not health disparities broadly. This is a strategic part of NIMH's mission in terms of research, thinking about, um, I think it was in 2016 or 2017, where they, they really brought in this idea of there are behavioral health disparities and NIMH needs to fund and support that kind of work. I think they have four different strategic goals. This is part of their fourth goal. Um, and so, so this is part of kind of a national agenda to, to address it. And just since this is a public talk, if I can do my public service announcement about behavioral health for a second, if, I know I'm, there are probably a lot of psychologists here, but, but behavioral health is incredibly important. Um, behavioral health problems are ubiquitous. About in any given year, one in five Americans is going to be suffering, dealing with mental illness at that time. Uh, throughout our lifespan, one in two of us is gonna have enough symptoms where you can be diagnosed with uh, a DSM disorder, one in two, 50%, if you believe the National Comorbid Disorder. Many more people are going to have substance symptoms that are, you know, equally um, problematic. So this is a really, behavioral health is, is a really important thing to focus on um, as you're thinking about how can we, you know, improve health. Locally, don't take this to the bank because these are just local approximations based on the SAMHSA data, but in DFW, you know, our, our city, our city, right, our state, uh, our area, uh, 11 counties, There's, you can estimate there's going to be about in any given year. So this coming year, one and a half million of us is going to be suffering with some sort of mental illness in the next year. Over, over half a million are going to be dealing with uh, depression, a depressive episode. <laughs> um, so, um, so, you know, these are, these are easy numbers to look at on a slide, but uh, most of us have family or friends that have suffered or personally suffered with mental illness, every single one of those people is, a, you know, suffering with a depressive episode is devastating. It has consequences on families, on children, on jobs, on, on all sorts of things. So this is not a light load. I'm, it's right before spring break. I'm sorry to be doing this because this is not a light load to deal with. Um, and we also know from studies of burden, if you look at all sorts of medical conditions, what, how important is behavioral health for us to attend to and focus on? It's tremendous. It's one of the leading causes of disability. Um, you know, if you compare it to all other medical conditions, uh, um, behavioral health and mental health play an outsized role in causing burden on, on society. It's not so much lives lost, years lost. It's more uh, years lived with disabilities. This comes from the World Health Organization. And it's not surprising that it plays this role because mental health strikes when people are in their teens, when people are in their 20s, when, you know, normally or ideally we're, we're out, you know, starting our jobs, starting our families. That's when uh, we often see mental health striking, it, you know, it's, it's most severe. And then it tends, thankfully, go, to go down if you're looking at just prevalence rates as, as we get older. But, but uh, really, it has this really big burden. So it's important to focus on it. 
And the question that Jennifer and I and others at the center focused on was, okay, so you know we're we're really focused on this issue of behavioral health. We know it, it's it's you know having a massive toll in DFW. Is it having an equal toll? Do we all live in the same kind of city really when it comes to behavioral health, or are there disparities? And because we're nerds, <laughs> we uh, really tried to guide our focus based on what the data suggested. So when we looked at this data, you you know the first thought you have is. Well, maybe certain groups, and, and when they talk about disparities, they're, they're typically six kind that people talk about, um, gender, uh, race, ethnicity, geography, whether you live in rural America or not, um, whether educationally you have disadvantage, economic disadvantage, um, and, and sexual orientation. You know, those are the, the kind of groupings that people tend to look at when they, when they think about these things. And so we looked at the data. I, I don't know if I'm going too fast or too slow, given my talk. I think I'm fine. Um, so I'll spend a little bit of time talking about this. But um, but so what is the, what did the data say? And the data said when it comes to rural versus you know rural Texans, should we should we really be focused on rural counties outside of Denton? And and in fact, we we started an initiative, a telehealth initiative. This, by the way, was before COVID. <laughs> so, and we thought we were being so cool by starting this initiative. <laughs> And then the pandemic happened and it was like, oh, everybody's doing telehealth. But there was a time when telehealth was still kind of like, we don't know about that. Um, anyway, and, and, and you do see this difference. There are higher rates. This is not a dramatic, I mean, it is if you have one of these conditions, but it's not a dramatic difference between rural and, and, and urban. When it comes to race ethnicity, you see, um, you know, the multiracial group there is a smaller group, so it has a bigger standard error. Um, but you do see higher rates there. But when it comes to other groups, it's it's actually non-Hispanic whites who tend to have higher prevalence rates. This is from SAMHSA national data. Prevalence rates of mental illness. Um, Hispanic, uh, black, uh, often have uh, you know lower or equal levels. In other words, the story when it comes to disparities and race ethnicity is not so much, is not really the story of disparities. There are key differences. This is national data. Um, if you dig into this a little bit more, there are certain intersections where there are clear issues of um, certain social identities that intersect that, that do lead to, to higher rates of, of, of mental illness. Um, I know a lot of people are here interested in <clears throat> children and families and <clears throat> so if you look at this, this is a, a review uh, that compiled a lot of different national data sets to look at uh, pediatric behavioral health across the past year. And you do see, <clears throat> excuse me, differences between rural and urban kiddos <clears throat> across a lot of different conditions. You see higher rates of illness in rural areas than you do see in urban areas. <clears throat> Again, many of these are not massive or dramatic, but but they are differences when it comes to race and ethnicity and kiddos um, and a lot of different behavioral health conditions that we care about. <clears throat> Again, you see you do see some differences um, by ethnicity. Hispanics tend to have lower rates of, of a lot of these illnesses. There, there's a, a whole literature about why that might be the case, but um, but but you do see higher rates in, in black non-Hispanic and white non-Hispanic. You see lower rates in Asian non-Hispanic. So, um, so, so there are some differences in prevalence, but there are other kinds of disparities that you also see. And among sort of, for example, racial and ethnic minorities, there, there's a literature suggesting that um, when disorders do happen, they tend to be more persistent and have more burden. Um, there's also, again, this literature, particularly in areas of, around sexual orientation, where you don't have these, these uh, national large data sets because of the way data is collected, um, where they're, they're suggesting that there are certain intersections where, where you do find higher rates. But the real story, uh, not the real story, the, the bigger story in terms of behavioral health has to do with access to care. That's where you see a dramatic difference. And this is kind of the, the literature that guided us as we were thinking about, well, what are we gonna do in the center? And um, just to give you some snapshots of this, and I, I'm sorry, I'm going like really fast, you <laughs> like massive literatures, but I hope, hope you guys will excuse me, the, me going quickly. But um, in, in terms of disparities in access to care, this is a snapshot of two types of specialty mental health care. On the left are basically psychiatrists, and on the right are mental health <coughs> clinics, like H MHM MHMR type uh, clinics. And, you know, I'm not going to, you can read this article if you want, but um, there's, uh, the, the, the storyline is if you're in rural America, it's harder to, to find a psychiatrist locally. It just is. Most rural America is getting its care from 
um, federally sponsored uh, mental health clinic uh, facilities. Um, there, there's, uh, it, it's just there's a lack of pro providers in, in rural areas. That's also true for low income zip codes and low income areas. This looked by zip code as well, and they found that there was, in fact, um, you know, if you're in a low income area, you're, you're more likely to get your care from, from a clinic. And there, there are many reasons for that. When you look, um, oops. Just really quickly, um, this kind of data applied to DFW. If you look at it, where we, we've been drawing from these same data sets to look at DFW and what kind of where you know where are there uh, sort of I guess behavioral health deserts, if you will. You know, people talk about grocery food deserts. Uh, where are there behavioral health deserts? This map here is just private psychiatrists and private therapists. This does not include things like the VA or the big mental health clinic. So, so again, you know, read this map with some caution. But when you look at specialty mental health care, like, hey, can I go see a psychiatrist? Um, it, you know, it, I think it kind of follows the money. <laughs> like, and, and what you see is um, a place like, I don't know if you can tell here, but a place like, I think this is, um, this is like Preston Hollow right here oh, in North Dallas. Nice. That's the highest concentration of therapists and psychiatrists. So if you're looking to meet a therapist or psychiatrist in private practice, go to Preston Hollow. That's, that's a good that's a good place to do. The second highest is right here in South Lake, which is uh, right there. South Lake has the second highest uh, concentration of private practices. This is not number. This is number of practices. So this is by industry, by by company. So there might be you know ten people in that practice, but. Um, but but so you see in other areas with equally dense populations like South Dallas or rural counties, this includes all the rural counties where you see absolutely no representation uh, at all, at least with private ones. Now, this doesn't include the other ones I was talking about. So it's not surprising um, that you see this kind of disparities in access to care. You see it geographically, like I just showed you. You also see it in other ways. Um, racial, ethnic is a big one. You see that if you're Hispanic, Black, this, these are folks who had any mental illness in the past year and and presumably would need mental health care. How many of them actually went to get care, got care in the last year? This is from SAMHSA data. And the big headline from, from a study like, or from a work like this is that half the people who have mental illness in a given year are not getting care. I mean, like that's a big headline, okay? You should really understand that half the people in any given year are not getting care. That again is a complex reason why people, many of those people don't think they need care. So that's 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 one issue. But then many times they have trouble accessing care. There might be stigma, there, there might be economics is probably a big, big driver of what's going on here. But you also see that there's a real gap. So we saw it geographically. You see it also in terms of race, ethnicity. So for example, Hispanic, Black, Asian, um, their rates of accessing care, even though they have a mental illness, is much, much lower than, than say non-Hispanic white folks. In fact, a study that was done, and this is a little dated at this point, found that of all the metropolitan regions in the United States, Dallas-Fort Worth was the number one, not a good reason to be number one, hotspot for disparities in, in access to care among, say, Latinos versus whites, um, uh, non-Hispanic white. So, so, you know, DFW has a problem when it comes to making care accessible, and it's not a unique issue uh, to DFW. And here's some here's some just rough data related to that. If you look, for example, Dallas County, the population Hispanic, uh, about 40 percent. I'm not sure if that's current, um, but past behavioral visits were less than 20 percent. And you see that in all the, in the four big counties of, of DFW. So you see this kind of uh, disconnect. Again, uh, there's uh, reasons for this disconnect, and I, I don't mean to make it, uh, you know, there's a lot of complex reasons for why there is this disparity in accessing care. But Jennifer and I, as we went through the data, and really we were pretty darn intentional about what we were going to focus on when we took over the center, we said, you know, we really think the issue here is access. And if we're, there's one thing the center should focus on, it should focus on redressing that disparity in access to care. So let's be intentional and let's um, let's think about ways to do that. And so what we did in, in our center, and the center's still active and we're, we're actually still affiliated with and part of it, um, we decided to focus on four areas that I'll share today. The first um, is thinking about these underserved areas that we noticed in DFW. It's hard not to notice these areas that are underserved uh, when, you, when you look at that data. 
<laughs> and we thought, well, yeah, uh, we were part of a, a training clinic that was training clinical psychologists and, and other behavioral health providers. And we said, well, why don't we find a way to get at least our students out to these communities? And uh, so we wrote some grants to do that kind of stuff. Um, and we were incredibly intentional about how we did this. And so we looked, we, we tried to identify, it's a little tricky because when you're in a training, running a training clinic, you can't just send people anywhere. You have to make sure that there's a really qualified psychologist to supervise and train and, you know, and provide good training when you do this kind of thing. But we were wondering, could we, you know, we could just send everyone to South Lake. We, we had, uh, uh, no, you know, there actually, there's uh, many practices in South Lake that desperately want trainees there um, you know it's a way for them to to, to sustain their their work um, and and many of our students do go to South Lake and Preston Hall and other areas like that but we thought can we make this a little more intentional about where they, they do that and the reason we did this was based also on evidence and there were two core things that we noticed when trainees go to work in certain communities they're more likely when they're done with training to go back and be in those communities. They, they, they understand those communities. They're more likely to return when they're out in the profession and, and work with those communities. Um, and uh, and so, so we thought about this. So we, we targeted areas, it wasn't perfect, but but we did our best. And, um, and you know, we still have students go into those areas. Um, since 2022, I asked uh, David Cicero, who's now uh, running the, this, uh, who took it over from us, um, you know, what's happened since 2022 and over 2000 clients have been served, you know, this is not, going to solve the problem, but but it's not nothing either. Uh, and uh, we were able to provide students stipends to go work in those areas and get additional training to work in those communities as well. So, but what was really cool is we also were really intentional about tracking where our students were providing services. And this is a map showing, I just created this yesterday, but this is a map where, um, we, where we tracked the zip codes of where our students were providing services relative to those areas that already had practices. And really great success in showing that our students were providing um, care in some of these underserved areas of North Texas. So, so really something that we're going to uh, use this slide again, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but really nice uh, demonstration that, that we were doing. it. So really great. We can pat ourselves on the back. That's lovely. Um, but it's not enough. <laughs> it's, it's not even close to enough. So another idea that we had is that, you know, most folks who are underserved um, never walk through the door of a therapist in the first place. Most care is provided either, unfortunately, in jail settings or it's provided um, with primary care doctors or, or community clinics. It's not really provided uh, in these specialty clinics. And most people, a lot of people struggle to understand how to connect with care. But there is one occupation that everybody trusts. It's the most trusted occupation. I, is it the most trusted? Okay, I think it's the most trusted occupation. And who happens to every day interact with thousands of people <coughs> and a lot of people who are in crisis and struggling with mental health and those are fired. Um, and so what we did is we designed a program to partner with fire departments and um, and really think about how can we um, train the, the, the firemen to, to do a better job of referring people for mental health services. There are a lot of programs like this nationally, but this is one that, that we sort of targeted. This is in its pilot phase right now. Um, well, anyway, it's a lot of complications that have nothing to do with this. But but so we are in the in the process right now of meeting with the firemen to make sure this is a program that they want and that they that they um, that, that really helps them. And so you know these are the the departments that initially you know expressed uh, support and said we want to be part of this. Um, and we're working them, with them to figure out what training are you going to get that helps helps them uh, increase their referrals for mental health. So anyway, so that's a, kind of a second area. But it wasn't just about um, sending more people to to get uh, to these underserved areas as, as we thought about, like, what can we do? There was also a big focus and, and really thanks to Jennifer, a big focus on what um, the, the kinds of, of trainees we had in our program and the kinds of students we were sending to these areas and the kind of workforce we had when you're talking about disparities. And there are theoretical models that suggest that, you know, one way to mitigate the effects of social determinants of health on mental health disparities is through a workforce that's representative of the communities where they're working. Now, this was a, just a theoretical model 
And so again, we're kind of nerds. So like, it's a really data support. I mean, this is a nice idea. Like who doesn't like social justice? Who doesn't like the idea of fairness and representation? I mean, you know, that's a really lovely idea, but we're really particularly interested in, is there evidence to show this actually works? And so, you know, evidence is not perfect. It never is, but, but we looked at certain evidence and here are two pieces of evidence that I think are interesting. Um, the first comes from an older study from uh, the American Psychological Association, and apologies for the non-psychologist. I'm a psychologist, so everything I do is through this filter of psychology. But when you look at the, at least the profession of psychology, what you find is um, on this left, it's, it's interesting, um, there are four different groups there, providing services to Hispanics at the top, um, providing services to Black African American, providing services to rural populations, and to working poor populations. And the first thing you notice, that this is a survey of psychologists, and ask them, are you providing services to these populations? And the first thing you notice is that more than half of these psychologists surveyed said, nope, not providing services uh, to those populations. So, so there is already a big disparity in terms of who's getting care, and it's not these four groups. But the other remarkable thing about it is if you look at the identity of the psychologist who's responding, white versus uh, racial ethnic minority, that you do see a difference, that racial ethnic minority psychologists tend to provide more services than non. Um, so this is all based on self-report. <clears throat> when you look at a more recent survey done, uh, uh, put out in 2022 by APA, and you look at the different kinds of practice, like individual solo practice, hospital settings, or VAs, what you notice is that the vast majority of psychologists in this workforce study um, were, were white females. So you see a massive gender imbalance in the kind of workforce we have. You have working, for example, in VA settings where, where the, I'm not sure exactly the proportion of male to female clients in VA settings. Does anyone know? Anyway, there's, there's a, it's, it's, it's a large male representation in VA settings oftentimes, and yet the vast majority of clinicians in those settings, 63% uh, are female. So you see these kind of big gender imbalances happening in the workforce. And this isn't news necessarily, but, but it's important. Uh, you also see ethnic imbalances where, where underrepresented psychologists, um, based on ethnicity, you see a, a massive underrepresentation. So looking at a little more data of this issue of does the workforce matter that, that we're training? And, um, and here's another piece from that 2022 one. Again, this is their own endorsement of how culturally knowledgeable they felt. What psychologists uh, said is that the, the one group that they felt really uh, right here culturally knowledgeable to work with was, uh, was white uh, populations that all the other, these other groups, um, these, they're self-reporting that they do not feel comfortable, culturally knowledgeable working with them, or only somewhat knowledgeable, um, or not at all, I don't think not at all, but, but somewhat. So they're reporting less knowledge. That has consequences, because if you look here on the left, this corresponds to who they're actually working with, the frequency of contact. And it maps pretty closely, not closely, it maps on to kind of their cultural knowledge. Now, again, I, this is not a perfect study by any means, but it's evidence that the, the nature of the workforce matters. And, and Jennifer, I think, has been a leader nationally in thinking about this and talking about this. Uh, Jennifer and I did a study uh, a few years ago, a really cool one, where we took 10 years of data of every single psychologist in, in every doctoral program in the United States. So pretty awesome study across 10 years. Because one of the thoughts is, okay, but that's the old guard. You know, the old guard was this kind of like, you know, had all these kind of issues in terms of lack of workforce representation. The country has changed. Younger generations are coming in. You know, demographic diversity is happening. Uh, this will just fix itself. And looking at the training data, the answer is it's, yeah, it's a little better, but it's definitely not fixing itself. So, for example, probably one of the most dramatic uh, discrepancies you see is in terms of gender. 80% of our psychologists in the training pipeline are men, are women, I'm sorry. Um, there's a huge gender imbalance in psychology. And, um, and, and again, that, that has repercussions to, to think about. Um, the other one is in terms of race, ethnicity, Hispanic, Latino, um, black, African-American are underrepresented. This is it, the black, the, the dark is in the, um, the population and uh, I'm sorry, is the, is the tr trading workforce and the white colored bars are the population levels. And so you see this kind of discrepancy. We couldn't look at every single thing because we just didn't have the data, but we did have disability data, for example. And again, you see um, 
the uh, folks um, who have a disability are way underrepresented in the psychology workforce compared to folks with disability who are in the workforce. So um, the, the bigger gap is just disability, but the other one is folks with disability in the workforce. And you see still a big, pretty big discrepancy. This, this has repercussions because it, it's harder to, uh, to work with folks if you, you have no understanding of their kind of backgrounds. Um, one of the ideas, a lot of programs, uh, when we're looking at, you know, thinking about this, this workforce and what this center could do to kind of address these issues, a lot of programs really spent, really went heavy on this idea of let's just create inclusive environments, you know, with this kind of a thought that maybe it's that folks from uh, unrepresented backgrounds are dropping out of programs more. So we looked at this with data, because again, kind of nerdy. <laughs> And you do see slight dif d uh, discrepancies in terms of attrition based on some of these factors. But I did the calculation, if there was zero attrition, would this solve the issue? And the answer is not even close. The issue is not attrition. I mean, that, that's important. Uh, but the issue really is not attrition. It's about who's in those programs. And, um, and so the idea that this is self-writing, this is going to fix itself because younger generations are, are more diverse, that's not true. That's not happening. And here you see the growth of these uh, groups. And again, this is not all important demographics. It's just the ones we have data for. So apologies for, for the lack of uh, discussion of other groups. But you see that this is pretty much flat. Meanwhile, here's a graph of the population changes that are projected uh, you know, to, to 2060. Our, our country is dramatically changing, and yet our workforce is not. So if you believe this is going to change, I have a newsflash for you. It's not, uh, at least based on this 10 years of data. OK, unless we are intentional and do things about this. So so we have to think about it. So we thought about um, and I don't know what to do about it. Like We're just we're looking at the data right now. Well, I don't know. What to do. Like, let's think about the data. Um, so uh, these are really big problems. These are huge social issues. I, I don't claim to have the answers to what to do about it. But but I think we should be aware of what's going on. Um, so we did look at data and Jennifer in particular has been really instrumental in doing this. Where are the issues? And again, we, th these are just two groups because we have the data. It's not because these are the only groups that matter. But you see, once po folks get into a doctoral program, it's pretty steady. There's a slight drop. And actually, from the US population to graduating with a psychology degree, you don't see this massive misrepresentation. You see a cliff in the area between when people graduate from college and when they get into a doctoral program. For some reason, doctoral programs are, are, are you know, there's, it, it, again, I don't know why, but the data suggests that the problem is at the point of admissions. It's not at the point of attrition for programs. It's not that people are dropping out. It's, it's, it's really the point of admissions that there's some fundamental issue going on. There, there's also bottlenecks with respect to geographic diver diversity. So again, um, you know, South Texas, uh, I grew up in South Texas. I know that um, there's a massive lack of providers in South Texas. And when you train someone from South Texas, you know, up here in Dallas, they're more likely to go back to South Texas to work. Why? Because they have family. I mean, I'm in Texas now. I have family in Texas. It's a big reason I'm back in Texas. I grew up here. You know, so um, so 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 this kind of thing really matters. Um, uh, I was tempted to stay in the East Coast, but 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 yeah, family matters. So, um, and so there's a geographic diversity. The other issue is one of access that, you know, students have a hard time. They tend to go to schools that are nearby that they know about. And so so it's really important that we have diversity in the workforce uh, geographically as well. So what did we do about it? As part of the center, we started national partnerships. Uh, for example, we uh, started meeting with CUDCUP, which is the Council of University Directors of Clinical Psychology. Again, kudos to Jennifer leading that. Um, this is a, a national partnership where we develop a task force to think about these issues of the workforce and what can be done. And I have to say, there's 20, about 20 different initiatives that this task force is pursuing. They're actually really quite cool, and I can't get into all of them now, but we're leading it, and, and it's really a, a phenomenal group of people doing uh, cool work. <clears throat> okay, so that was, uh, so, you know, we said, okay, what can we do about it? Let's send people to these underserved areas. Let's think about who we're sending, what we can do about sort of the training pipeline. Um, the other third kind of big area is, is uh, rethinking traditional services. And, um, and, and one of the realizations, again, not to, to we're not big nerds, but, but we do look at data a lot. And, 
And one of the things we notice is that, okay, if you send, if you train more people, is that going to fix the problem? If you change the, the, this composition of who you're training, is that going to fix the problem? And I, I think that is so important. That's really important, but that's not the whole story. That will not solve it entirely. I hope I'm not depressing everyone. <laughs> but but I, I think this is an opportunity. This is a challenge. I mean, th this is this is what UTD and other universities can do in Texas. I mean, we can be leaders in this. So anyway, um, we, we, uh, we can't just train our way out. This is a study that was done, again, a little dated, looking at if you were to, if, if, if psychology were re to really meet the needs of the population, if we, if we had enough psychologists to meet the unmet needs, in other words, people who wanted to go see a psychologist but could not, for whatever reason, economically, how many more psychologists would the nation need? This was a study that the APA did years ago. And the answer was about 20,000 more. And I think the whole workforce is 100,000, less than 100,000. So, so you're talking about a massive increase in the number of trainings. I promise you there are not that many new training programs coming online training psychologists. So you really have to think, rethink what you're doing. And that problem, by the way, is not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Um, so Jennifer hates me for talking about total factor productivity growth, but, but I think that um, one of the things is, for me at least, what this means is we really need to focus on the science of clinical. There needs to be a clinical science. We can't just train people. We need to be smarter about what we're doing. And you can look at all sorts of other industries for examples of this. This is agriculture, by the way. Uh, this is, you know, the total number of input. One farmer back in the day could only produce so many bushels. Uh, one farmer today can, you know, run acres and acres of, of crops solo. And typically, you know, when you think about productivity in any kind of industry, uh, in the U.S., at least, it's, it's run about 2%, which means about every 30 years, what one worker does in America doubles every 30 years. Is that the case in psychology? Is, you know, we're training people, and those people are saying, I want to go out and put a shingle up and do it just like they did it 30 years ago. That's great, but it's not going to solve a national problem um, if we're serious about solving a national problem. It won't fix it. Um, and so, so we have to think you know, we have, we, we're, we're challenged and forced to think about what can we do differently. Uh, again, I don't have the answers, but I'm just, you know, and there, there are lots of models for this. You know, lots of people talk about this. Um, one of the, just one that I want to highlight is, is in the UK, you may know about the, the, they have this national effort that they started in the 2000s called talking therapies. Um, and the idea was that they wanted to do evidence-based treatment on a population level. So they said, CBT works great. We need to get this to everyone. Why are we just giving out medications? Let's try to get people into CBT. But one of the core elements of this program in the UK, which is run, you know, the UK has a federalized system, is that it involves stepped care. And so stepped care means that um, you have low-cost interventions that aren't going to work for everyone but they're gonna work for a lot of people. Why are you gonna start with a really high cost intervention like an expensive clinical psychologist when you have low cost ones that work? I'm not saying this is a panacea by any means, but you'd be surprised at how many places you call to ask for care and they say, we'll put you on our waiting list. And that's it. There's no like, while you're waiting, why don't you try doing this self-help program or do this thing, which doesn't cost anything. When we look at behavioral, when we look at the issue in Texas of a lack of access, we need to be thinking about step care. And me personally, I've been thinking about digital step care a lot. Um, there's growing evidence that some of these digital uh, things and uh, smartphone apps, even ones with zero professional guidance, have effects on depression. Uh, Cohen's D, or, or, or a, a G, if you will. Um, these are not really massive effects, but they're small effects. And you know what? Those interventions cost pennies. Um, and so the idea is, why aren't we giving this vast swath of the population who has no access right now at least something that, that helps a little bit? I'm not saying that's equitable, but I'm saying something is better than nothing. And so thinking more about sort of these kinds of things, we're doing a lot of other work. I'm, I'm not going to get into any of this other work, but um, there are lots of people nationally doing this. John Toros at Harvard, uh, who has someone at UT Southwestern that he collaborates with a lot, um, is thinking about digital clinics. Uh, we have tried to do this at the center focused on Spanish uh, apps. We know that lack of English proficiency is one of the big reasons that Latinos in Texas 
uh, for many Latinos that don't get care is that they, they can't find providers who speak Spanish. And so what we have done is we've curated which of these, and by the way, there's jillions of apps. Most of them don't work. Most of them don't have any evidence. So we thought we're a public institution. The more we can do is we can say, hey, what is the research base? And at least provide guidance of these have some evidence. There's a clinical trial that show, shows it works. These, we have no idea. And so we, we try to, we're trying to curate that literature to, to show what works and what doesn't work. Um, we're doing a lot of other things. I just put in an RON one a couple of weeks ago with uh, a lot of people, but, but where we collected data. A lot of what psychology does can be, um, you know, AI is, is going to change the field. I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but, um, but, but, but the reality is if we are really serious about clinical science, we have to embrace this kind of stuff. And, um, and I'm not, it, there will be nothing to replace a relationship that's fundamental, but there are a lot of tasks that psychologists do that are boring, frankly, and that could be expedited with AI. Um, for example, we're doing five hour assessments that, AI could do three of those hours and the psychologist could do two. So that's the kind of stuff we're talking about at the margins where I think this is really going to have a huge impact. <clears throat> and so the fourth and final area, uh, fourth and final area is that we were doing in this uh, center, and thanks for letting me share all this, is just doing basic research. I'm not going to get into this, but we, fund, uh, we funded lots of different projects. Um, we funded lots of different research poster sessions. Uh, and we're doing just a host of, 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 of kind of initiatives, collaborating with different researchers and really funding them um, to do work on their own to, to focus on this issue of behavioral health disparities. So we've gotten federal funding to, to do this kind of work. Um, and so this is really kind of exciting. And this is like a million ideas. And if one of them blossoms, it's, it's kind of a, it could, could have lots of impact. So, so this is the kind of work that we're doing in the center. So, um, you know, we were confronted with this kind of issue of behavioral health disparities. We, we tried to think thoughtfully about, like, what could we do? Uh, Jennifer and I are just like two people. <laughs> so, like, what can we do? And, uh, and we fo focused on these four areas, and I think they're important areas. I think they dovetail nicely with what uh, the center for, for, is doing here um, in terms of its focus and its mission uh, and really thinking about what it can do to improve the health, you know, in, in DFW and beyond. Um, so, Dr. Owen can't retire or leave <laughs> or staying. Uh, there's just way more work to do. I want to thank colleagues at my previous institution um, who've been, you know, who've really helped with the center. And, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Thanks. So I am hoping this is a conversation dialogue. And so I'd love to have thoughts and, and conversation about this, about the, this issue of behavioral health disorders. I have two questions. One is a very basic, naive one, and then I've got a more complex one. But my very basic one is um, uh, you've been talking about uh, behavioral and mental health. Normally, we just hear the term mental health. Can you tell me why you use the term behavioral health? Yeah, I, the, I use the term because it's a broader term. Okay. So, so it includes things like sub, substance use is a, is a really uh, big issue. It also includes behavioral health. Um, that has, you know, more direct impact with physical health. So, um, so there's some interchangeability of those, but but it's a broader term. Okay, thank you. And then um, my other question was in terms of representation in the workforce. Um, you mentioned Spanish language was one of those barriers, but I was also just wondering, are the problems that um, people needing help um, don't walk through the doors if they know that that there isn't someone who can, I feel like can relate to me in that office, I don't trust them, or is it the health provider um, doesn't provide services, good enough services, <laughs> services as well to somebody that they, as you, they mentioned, I mean, they've self-reported that I, I can't understand people, non-white people very well, are the services they provide so hard? Yeah. Oh, sure. So the question is, is <laughs> now we'll now we'll see how much I understand the question. Um, the, the question is, where is the problem when it comes to a, a gap in access? Is it that folks are not walking into the door or is it when they walk through the door, they get such 
for blocking terrible service or or bad outcomes that, that, that they're kind of scared away from it and don't don't want to go back. But there's there's really a mismatch there. I have an anecdotal answer to that, but then some good studies. But I'm really curious uh, if Jennifer disagrees with with what I say here. Um, <laughs> So, um, so anecdotally, I worked in hospital settings, uh, and, and I was up in Rhode Island, which, which there's a really big Puerto Rican community there, um, and uh, uh, and but none of the physicians were Puerto Rican. They're, they're absolutely none. Very few of them spoke Spanish. Many of these folks didn't speak any English at all when they, they came to the hospital. This is at Rhode Island Hospital, and um, and it was uh, it was striking to me the kind of experience they had. It was the physicians anecdotally. They, they not mean spirited, but just from a lack of connection, they they treated those clients differently than than the clients that came from Warwick, who had grown up generations in Warwick. You know, there was a bond there. There was a conversation, and yet I, I saw some differences, and and it's hard to know. So so that might be it, but I, I don't think the evidence supports that as much. And I, I'm thinking of one study, particularly in California that was done, and it wasn't done with Latinos, it was done with Asian population uh, who did or did not speak English. And you see the levels of, and this was a, a large statewide study, um, but you see this dramatic drop. And when they queried reasons, it was because they, they, they didn't understand English and they felt the care was only gonna be in English. And so, so, so it was really initiated by, it wasn't that they were scared of you know the treatment or anything like that uh, or had bad experience, but just simply one of language availability and, and not thinking that that was a place that literally they could be understood. So, yeah. Um, this has been great. I love this talk. And I want to talk to both of you a lot more about a bunch of ideas. <laughs> but um, one of the questions I had was just when you're looking at that difference in prevalence for ethnicity when we look at these disparities, how does that take into account? Are there differences in diagnosis and rates of diagnosis and someone being diagnosed from a different ethnicity, non-white mm. being diagnosed with a mental health or behavioral? Um, yeah, is that- is Yeah, that no, no, there are differences. For example, uh, with respect to schizophrenia, you see racial differences in the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Back in the day in the 1970s, I mean, there was a horrible legacy of that. Um, and, and a big difference, uh, and it was something that psychiatry took really seriously. Um, but but you do you see differences in based on that. Um, I'm not sure how big those differences are, but but you do see those kinds of differences. Yeah. Is there a question back? that their culture is against that being an opportunity like a possible job we're <laughs> supposed to do engineering or medicine or have these three options and they don't value the psychology because they feel like that's not a good fit. Are you seeing something like that? Is that just like a kind of thing or are you seeing some stigma for some groups to be involved in taking decisions? I don't have. I don't know. No, I don't know if the data exists. I don't know of any data on that. The, the question is whether certain uh, groups, uh, men, for example, <laughs> what is why are men not interested in psychology as much? Um, you know, whether there are certain cultures where where going into the psychology profession is kind of dissuaded. Um, and and I don't know data. I'm not sure if you know Jennifer, but. Um, but uh, I think that anecdotally, I've, I've had the same experience where, um, you know, there, there's just a culture, there are cultures, and I, I think it's also important models. Um, it's shocking when you see someone do something, and I hope anyone here who's seen what we do did realizes, like, you, you can do stuff. <laughs> like, I, I'm, I'm always struck by students by how often they think they don't have power, and yet they have immense power. And, and it's just really a, a realization that, that you, it just takes work and, and, and if you pursue it. But anecdotally, if you see someone who comes from your community doing something, it has really strong effects. Part of what the, the workforce is doing is it's trying to create micro networks. In other words, um, canvassing between big doctoral institutions like UT Dallas. It's funny because I talked to some faculty at UT Dallas and they were like kind of humble about UT Dallas sometimes I notice. I, you know, they're like, oh, UT Dallas. UT Dallas is, a, is a, 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 such a powerful institution in Texas. Um, and I've been to other universities in Texas where much smaller programs and, um, and they, they want connections with these bigger ones. And when you have those kind of connections, suddenly students from those universities start 
thinking about, hey, maybe I can go to UT Dallas and get a doctorate degree. And, and so you start building the, that kind of modeling. And so that's one of the, the really big focus of the, of the task force is trying to create those pathways so that it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm doing this for the first time. No one from my community has ever done this <laughs> or from my family. Yes, um, I mean stigma is is one, and there is uh, a, a a good amount. Uh, a, you know, I would <clears throat> there 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 are studies of, of whether there are cultural factors keeping someone from seeking care. Stigma in Latino groups, for example, is 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 a known sort of deterrent of seeking care. Um, and so, whether that's the whole story or just part of the story, it's just part of the story. But but it is part of the story. So the more Latino providers, does that solve it or not? And what are the factors that need to come together? Yeah, 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 absolutely. I think that's a good point. I don't know if others have thoughts on this issue. Yes? I have a question. Um, so I really appreciate this talk, by the way. But uh, one thing I'm curious about is uh, also with like workforce representation as well. You brought up a little bit about cultural knowledge. Um, and I, I'm a doctoral student here, and I've got friends in other like more clinical programs um, and more counseling-based programs. And they have some element of like cultural competency courses. I think that's like more and more common in a lot of practical programs now. Um, but like anecdotally, I hear them sometimes complain about like the quality of those courses, where they feel like, um, especially because these are a lot of like a lot of my friends happen to also be students of color, and so they struggle a lot in terms of like discussions and conversations that are had in those classes. Um, and I'm curious if you encountered this complaint, I guess, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, those those courses, um, yes. That, that is common, and particularly um, from students who, in those courses, just anecdotally, um, uh, from students who, who come from underrepresented groups who aren't normally, it, 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 it is a struggle, and, and sometimes those can be really difficult. Um, I see so much variability in how those courses are taught, um, from some that are just really kind of discussion-based to others that are heavy on, on literature. Um, and so um, I think there's really wide variability in how that specific kind of course, those cultural knowledge courses are taught. And there's different models of, of cultural knowledge. Uh, we work with someone who really focuses on the idea of cultural humility and sort of emphasizing this idea that it's not so much about, you know, your cultural knowledge, but just sort of your cultural humility and understanding where the limits of your your, your knowledge might be um, and, and willingness to learn beyond that. So. Um, so, so yeah, I, I absolutely have heard that kind of concern, and I, I don't have a great uh, solution right now for that kind of issue. I'm curious if others do. Yeah. Um, jumping off of that idea, I'm an undergraduate student here, and um, I think the undergraduate psychology program here is absolutely wonderful in preparing you for like research or clinical practice or you know all of these different areas. I'm wondering if we could start taking courses like that, like you mentioned, and applying them to the undergraduate population, seeing if that could help alleviate some of the um, barrier there where people feel more comfortable because they've just had more experience with like interacting with a diverse, diverse population of people. Yeah, I, I think having those experiences and, and being able to discuss them in a way that's safe and, 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 and you know, um, doesn't feel threatening to people is really important. And I think that, um, that there's a lot of fear, unfortunately, around these issues and um, fear, fear and, and it's unfortunate because I don't think there needs to be fear. I think that, I think having contact with people outside of your community, uh, you'd be shocked at how that reduces all sorts of vices. Yes. And we have, and you're sitting next to the Dean, by the way, so you can better answer this question. <laughs> about um, has representation, as you acknowledge, uh, in what, what we've been doing in the center, with the Center for Children and Families. And what I want to say to you is volunteer with the Center for Children and Families. I was going to say that. Yes. But <laughs> the experience, I love your map of where you have placed clinics and, and where you have placed students into clinics, existing clinics, you know, to get them out of, sorry, person hall. Um, <clears throat> and, that's what we hear from the students who place in and have experiences in our programs that are in what we can call underserved neighborhoods. 
and they say, you know, these are students, and they're students of color, and students not of color, and they say, I, I never knew my community. Uh, knowing UTD is not knowing my community, but now I feel that I do. And when we had uh, pediatric residents who wanted to come and talk to the parents in our in our programs, we said we have to come and stay for the whole hour and fifteen minutes and get on the phone with the families. Um, then you will have, we hope, a greater comfort in um, working with these families. And I, you know, but what you're doing is, um, I think it's clinical science training, and we can do it early, we can do it late. I mean, at any age range, because it's wonderful. So thank you so much. Yeah. But we want to talk more. <laughs> <laughs> really fantastic ideas. One more question. Yes. Um, I'm also looking to get a blood into clinical psychology future um, after masters, but um, one problem that I was seeing to see that I think kind of goes into my question. I was wondering, like, I noticed that a lot of the PhD and PsyD programs happen to have, like, really small acceptance, like, pools of people. Yeah. Like, normally, like, four or, like, six people. Mm -hmm. So do you think that raising that pool of students mm -hmm. can probably combat the issue of, like, representation mm -hmm. in the psychology? Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a real issue. And, um, <clears throat> and I don't know if, if, Jennifer, if you want to answer this question. Um, uh, because I know you think a lot about these kind of issues. Oh, sure. Okay. No, so the question is, for a lot of students, it's kind of discouraging to see such small admissions classes. Um, oftentimes, I know at our old university, we'd get hundreds of applications and only be able to accept six. Um, so, so that's a real discouragement for a lot of students. I think uh, at, the, at the big picture level, things that you'll get to see in your careers that we might not really have enough to see in ours is a shift in the master's versus doctoral way of thinking. And so they're coming online with accrediting master level programs that are only two years long and they take much larger numbers than most students. So they'll turn out more and more of the go into the community practitioner people more rapidly. The doctoral degree will have to become more the folks that are focusing on generating the science that talks about how to increase the productivity, how to make things more effective. So you'll get to see that shift in your lifetime. But it's still really important that that doctoral level be representative, because if your science is not representative, the science they produce is also not representative. I can't repeat all that. <laughs> <laughs> but that was a really great answer. <laughs> Um, so that's a perennial problem for students uh, and a real one. And, and the importance of, 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 of seeking out mentorship um, you know, and, and having opportunities to get mentorship. And I'll, and I'll add to that too. I was just at a conference that was all uh, the departments of psychology chairs, and this conversation came up quite a bit, right? And there's not a good answer yet, but part of this also means thinking about our criteria and what we value. And you know, right now we know that a lot of the criteria to get into these really into these programs that are pretty competitive are things like number of papers and all these experiences which are tied to privilege, right? And so um, the chairs were talking quite a bit about how do we change the, the way that we make these evaluations so that we really have more representation um, in science. So it's an ongoing conversation that these the systems that are that have been built that are going to take a while to, to figure out how to break. Yes, I noticed that on um, even for me, I'm looking into going to a master's in counseling, but even then going and taking that step is costing me a lot more money to even then pursue that. So then I feel limited to even just even go further and doing that for a while. So I was wondering like a lot of other students who want to improve that representation in the workforce is like that same kind of sentiment and really so. Yes, please. Yes, if you're not in the correct window. But one thing that we've started doing that launches this summer for the first time is uh, we're calling it a health career opportunity academy. And we're going into high schools that are populated by mostly um, kids who are in economically disadvantaged homes. And we're going to pay them to uh, study with us for the summer. And we're going to be exposing them to a behavioral health curriculum. So the goal is to give them some of that privilege that other students might get through a more affluent high school or through parents paying for individual tutoring 
and instead we're going to give them stipends to to spend time on us pre-psychology <coughs> and we're going to repeat that for people entering college and then people who are finishing college so that's what i'm saying you're on the unfortunate <laughs> <little> <laughs> <topic>. <laughs> And there, there are programs like that here at UTD. Well, she's in our, our year program. Yeah. Okay, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. She's got one of them. We got, we're going to get you more programs. So she's in our NSF RU program as well. So we're trying. We, we see the same, that undergrad, I feel like we have a great diversity of our undergraduate students here at UTD and trying to get those students that real world training out in the field where you are learning about different communities, whether it's the one you're from or another one. Building on that is something we, like Margaret said, really are working to do. So I'm so excited you guys are here. Um. Yes. And 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 for, for us, it's been really interesting. What what we we want to be really humble about whatever we do and understand: is there really data to suggest this is having any impact whatsoever? And and you can't hold yourself to too high a standard, otherwise you won't ever do anything. But but um, but we are trying to track what we're doing and 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 think about is is this really helping? And you know, we come from at it from a perspective of of employees of a state institution that really has an obligation to Texas and Texans and. I think every day, like you know, we th this is a public good. These universities, and so whatever we can do to to help, you know, the public good, I think is incredibly important. So, okay, thank you so much. Thank you. I also want to just announce for everybody the that was fabulous. Thanks. Um, I want to announce the forum which we have. So just again, we have this has been our spring lecture series. It kind of culminates. We have our big event on April 19th, Friday, April 19th, starting at nine o'clock. It's from nine to 1.30. We have Margaret Cahey coming. We have panelists, including Abigail Sharp. Raul Rojas is coming back. So he's gonna be one of our panelists um, and Cynthia Froth. So we have a great um, group of speakers for that as well. A lot more kind of table discussion, hopefully solving the world's problems in one day. That's the goal. So hopefully you will all register. We would love to see you there as well. And thank you so much. Thank you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you everyone. Thank you.